Hi, everyone. This is the Marine Biology Mentor Session. My name is Jen. I'll be your host for today. Uh, I'm going to give folks a few minutes to just join us. Um, as you're joining, uh, please do pop in the chat where you're joining from. I'd love to hear uh, where folks are. Um, and also a reminder that you can also po post any questions that you have for our mentors today in the, in the chat. Um, and I will do my best to get them asked for you. Give a couple more seconds here for folks to join. Um, I'm really excited to hear all about marine science today. Um, I am fascinated by the ocean and also terrified by it. Um, so I'm really excited to hear about all the work that these amazing mentors are doing. Okay, so I'm going to kick things off. Um, first, I want to start with a um, just by acknowledging that uh, I am streaming from the um, uh, traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples who have been stewarding these lands for, since time immemorial um, and just want to gratefully acknowledge that stewardship and that continued stewardship today. Okay, so ooh, we got some new West of Vancouver. Awesome. Um, okay, I'm going to ask um, our tech to please bring up our mentors so that they can introduce themselves. There we go. Lovely faces. So yeah, I'm going to start off um, by asking each mentor to just tell us who they are, a little bit about what they do, um, and maybe just something that they really love about what they do. Let's start with Kendi. Hello, um, I am Kendra Nelson. I'm originally from Arizona, United States. I went to school in Hawaii for three and a half years and got my degree, uh, Bachelor's of Science in biology with a marine emphasis from BYU Hawaii. Um, and now I live in Vancouver, lower Vancouver, and quite quite a difference. It's very cold. I'm, I struggle a lot. Um, <laughs> but I have special interests in invertebrates and killer whales, specifically the southern resident population that lives just offshore. And yeah, I think that's that that that's me. That's basically me. What's cool about studying killer whales? Oh, every, well, everything. I'm more focused on the conservation education outreach side of killer whale work, not the research. Um, but I'm up to date on the research and there's a lot of cool stuff coming related to southern resident killer whales, especially with looking at their feces and seeing what their diet is made out of through their feces and how their diet has been changing because of their lack of their primary prey, which is the Chinook salmon, which is right here on my little thing. I cannot point right there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, stuff like that is like super cool. Really cool. Um, Kush, tell us about yourself. Okay. Hey, everyone. I'm Kush Jogul. Um, uh, I'm an oceanographer. Um, I am currently based in Vancouver, but I'm originally from a very small remote island called uh, Mauritius. It's uh, in the middle of the Indian Ocean near Madagascar, if you've never heard of it. Um, and I studied, um, I did my first degree um, in science, my bachelor's in uh, oceanography, physics, and marine biology um, in South Africa in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Norway to do my master's also in oceanography. And then I went to New Zealand to do my PhD uh, also in uh, ocean science, in physical oceanography. Um, and so my I, I spend a lot of time trying to understand how uh, the physics of the ocean and how the ocean moves around, how the ocean transports things around. So I don't look directly at marine life in the ocean but i look at how things change in the ocean that affect the marine life um, and to do that i use underwater robots um, i'm more than happy to talk about them if uh, any of you is interested um, and what i love about my uh my field is that i get to travel a lot to do field work and I get to go to remote places um, a lot like uh, to Antarctica for example or in places where there's no act no like road access or um, very beautiful remote places so I really like that I'm I feel um, I'm quite lucky to get to get to study the ocean in these places yeah, that's me. 
sounds incredible. Uh, how about you, Mackenzie? Hi, I'm Mackenzie. Um, I grew up in Hawaii. I went to Chaminade University of Honolulu. I, funny enough, got my bachelor's of science in forensics and a minor in chemistry. I did everything except for one of my research projects in the marine field, however. So uh, when I uh, first started my master's, I went into marine, or sorry, bioengineering and biomechanics, and I was working uh, with the Dr. Ruth Gapes lab, who I did my first marine internship with, um, working on coral genomics. Um, unfortunately, we ran out of funding and I had to drop out, but I am currently on the process to continue uh, doing that. But all of my career since then has been in the marine field. I've been a marine naturalist, uh, I've worked with invertebrates, typically coral as well as urchins, but I've also done a lot of conservation for our lovely humpback whales. What I love about my field uh, is the people. Everyone's generally a really wonderful person. I don't think I've ever worked with somebody in a lab that I haven't just had a great connection with and had a lot of fun with. And that's not something I can say for other fields that I have worked alongside. So <laughs> that always helps. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we do have a question from uh, Millian, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, around uh, how exactly do you collect killer whale feces? <laughs> Maybe just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, primary, the killer whale feces are detected by a dog, actually, and one of the most famous dogs that does this is Eba, and she is with uh, Wild Orca. She is um, Dr. Deborah Giles' dogs. Deborah Giles is big in orca research. Um, she's with Wild Orca, the organization, and there's like a little... There's a show on Disney Plus about like dogs. I don't know what it's called, but there's an episode all about Eba. It explains that basically they go out in the water, whales are spotted. They kind of trail behind the whales and the dog will be sniffing for poop. If she sees any, she'll alert people to it. And then they scoop it up and it is kept in little sample vials and then they will go analyze them back in their labs. That would not have been what I would have guessed to be the answer to that question. That's amazing. That's very cool. Um, Millian is also, I think, interested in hearing maybe a little bit more about the underwater robots that you have, Kush. Yeah, so um, you may have heard of drones. So I think it's the closest I can think of in terms of what instrument they operate like. Um, uh, so I have a little... Uh, Lego, uh, so a, mi a miniature version of the robot. So it looks like this. So um, I'm gonna bring it closer to the camera. So like a little plane with a tail and wings. Uh, so it's very tiny here, but in reality, it's probably um, the size of uh, uh, a human. So probably like 1.7 meters, about 50 kilos. Um, and what it does is, uh, it would dive in the ocean down to 1,000 meters mm -hmm. deep and then climb up. And on its way down and up, it's measuring um, various things in the water, like temperature, how salty the water is, what kind of uh, nutrients, so what kind of food mm -hmm. is available in the water for uh, marine life, um, and how much light is getting into the ocean. And um, yeah, so I use these kind of things to try and understand how um how the water moves around mm -hmm. and also um try to understand what attracts marine life to certain locations in the ocean um yeah <laughs> but they are very uh smart so you i actually can i pilot them wherever um i can have internet connection so i can pilot them from my phone mm -hmm. or my laptop um anywhere so it's really uh, kind of revolutionized, revolutionized the way in which we collect data in the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, especially in a world like today where in a global pandemic, we cannot just, you know, go anywhere, travel anywhere to, to do science anymore. Um, so having a remotely operated instrument is really key. And it can also go in any weather, rain, storm, sun, but seasons doesn't affect it, weather doesn't affect it. Wow. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, Nikola Tesla, <laughs> the Nikola Tesla is asking, um, are they autonomous? Uh, yes, they are. They're autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVs, yeah. 
Very cool. Um, so I'm curious to know, um, did you, did each of you know um, when you were in high school or maybe a little younger um, that you might end up in the field of marine science? Um, let's start with Kendra. Yes, um, so I first fell in love with killer whales when I was about, when I started realizing I was about three, but my parents say it was younger because we visited SeaWorld of San Antonio. I was born in Texas and originally from Texas and grew up going to SeaWorld my entire life every single year for probably until I think I was 19. Mm -hmm. um, we went to SeaWorld. We ended up going to SeaWorld of San Diego, which is the park in Wales I knew best all growing up. So my whole life, I was going to be a Shamu trainer, Shamu trainer, went to college to be a Shamu trainer. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't give a, I did not care about the field as a whole. I only cared about being a Shamu trainer. And then when I was in college, there was one day or one week I saw a job posting at SeaWorld San Antonio and I almost flew out to do it and to, uh, to like audition. You have to have, there's a whole tryout process, but I didn't, thank goodness. And I ended up falling in love with research in my second year of school, uh, in love with invertebrates as well. So very different from killer whales, specifically tenophores and echinoderms. So these little comb jellies and like starfish and sea urchins, those are my favorites. Fell in love with that and the more the research side of things. And I shifted completely from wanting to do um, really mostly anything with killer whales besides education outreach and into invertebrates probably when I was like 20. So I've been in it for the long haul. <laughs> what about you, Mackenzie? Um, so I think that this is a great example of you just got to do what you love. Uh, it, I literally could swim before I could walk. I have like the lessons of my, uh, I have pictures of it, of people, of me being in some lessons at six months old, being told I could swim better than any six month old they had seen. And I could not walk at that point, of course. And so I've always been a, a water baby. I've, I grew up in the ocean. Um, and in high school, I did both a marine science course and a, a forensics course. And what got me was I was deeply, deeply, deeply afraid of how uh, little <laughs> marine scientists make. Unfortunately, we aren't the uh, big ballers of the science community we don't have we don't get a lot of funding we don't get paid very much um and as somebody who grew up with not a lot of money and grew up with a lot of financial insecurity I didn't want to be in that position anymore in my life which is why I chose forensics uh and originally um and so I went into my school for forensics and I was doing it and it was fine I didn't really care and then uh, a couple of professors came up to me uh, particularly one that had worked close with me and wanted me to be her lab assistant and just kind of said, I I know you're doing well in this in the field, but you don't seem to love it. You seem like you kind of are miserable. Uh, we have this opportunity where the Hawaii Institute for Marine Biology is a lab through the University of Hawaii. And I went to Chaminade, which is a different, it's a private university. And they said, we have this opportunity where Dr. Ruth Gates, which if you've seen Chasing Coral, she's in there. She's a pretty famous coral scientist. Um, she had a lab at the at HIMB and she basically wanted a, a tester student, a student to see if she would allow st Chaminade students in her lab. Um, so I said, so they said, will you do that? Will you go and be the tester student? And I said, okay, I guess, why not? Um, so I went to be a tester student at HIMB in Dr. Ruth Gates' lab, and the rest is history. I knew that I couldn't go back. I knew that I had to do what I loved, even if I was going to make that very much money. And I just had to learn how to have a side hustle. That's why I do social media. That's why I do photography. That's why I do all sorts of things, so that I can make ends meet and still do the thing that I love, because you have to. You have to just love your job, or it's not going to be fun. So, yeah if you're if you know something from your childhood listen to it listen to yourself <laughs> yeah if shamu's calling if, if it's it was there just yeah don't, don't fight it exactly shamu, shamu calls <laughs> um Chris, tell us a little bit of, um about your path um for me uh, as i said i was born on a little island so i kind of grew up near the ocean as well and um i have this connection with the ocean um, and I agree with Mackenzie, like you, you kind of develop, you, you become passionate about something as a child and it's hard to let that go. Um, and combining that with your career, 
is is definitely a bonus if you get to do that. Um, so for me, um, I don't know, I always grew up enjoying science in general and the ocean. Um, so I chose in school, I studied science. I still, I chose to specialize in science. Um, and then as I grew up, I would like, I have a brother, an older brother. He's also a scientist, but, um, and he studied engineering. He, but he told me, um, you know, if you are in science, there's, a lot of other um, career opportunities other than engineering and medicine. So that kind of opened my eyes when I was, I think, 14 or 15 years old, because like, you don't really get told or exposed too much at that age. And it was um, a, a, he kind of opened a lot of doors for me in terms of thinking what or my career options if I enjoy science and I love the ocean and I love doing something for the environment. So that's what kind of got me into oceanography. Uh, and then one thing led to the other, like uh, I got a scholarship to do my uh, master's and then they told me, uh, would I be interested in going on a trip to Antarctica? And I said, yes, why not? <laughs> um, uh, so, and then, you know, I started developing this love for the field and every time I was getting new exciting things to do and meeting new people getting to do research in various places around the world um, so yeah I I it's still I'm still growing every day in the field and I'm learning every day it's not as rewarding financially as Mackenzie said but um, it's rewarding in many other ways if you if you're passionate about your field I guess, yeah. Awesome, we have some uh, questions, mostly two questions for you, Kush, uh, in the chat, um, and then a few for uh, everyone on the panel. So let's start with um, a question around garbage in the ocean. So the question is, does the movement of water move garbage around in the ocean, and does that impact the marine life? Uh, yes, uh, that's uh, a big component of, um, what I look at as well. So I look at how currents move in the ocean. So if I, if you, if you drop a plastic bag in a river close to you, even if you don't live near the ocean, you just, if there's a waterway, you're dropping a plastic bag, it's going to end up in the ocean some, somewhere. And so I, I, I try to understand what are these pathways in the ocean? If, uh, where's, where's the ocean carrying it? And, um, and yes, sadly, a lot of animals are not used to, uh, or marine life are not used to um, these pollutants or um, garbage. So they are curious. So they, they touch it, they eat it. And um, it's definitely um, not good for them. And we, I mean, uh, we are seeing it in a lot of, um, it's becoming more and more common. Um, um, I'm... I'm not a marine biologist, but um, I'm sure uh, there's a lot of studies that have shown that um, they're finding more and more plastic in uh, fish, not just plastic, but also microplastics. So it might be in sizes that we don't see them by eye, but they are there and um, it's, it's really not good for them, but also not good for us if we end up eating these animals that have plastic in them. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I add on? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that one of the things that we commonly hear about is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and that name has given it this like weird connotation in your head where you think mm -hmm. it's like one big patch of garbage all connected as like an island. Well, that's not necessarily it. It's the way that the currents have pushed it into this middle portion. And that becomes a big issue. As I said, I've worked with humpback whales and humpback whales have this migration between Hawaii and like Alaska, Vancouver area. And so they kind of swim right, right, right through that, right into like that area. And so we have wonderfully had an increase of their population since we decimated it during whaling. But now we are having this issue of they are consuming so much plastic that it's hard for them to, you know, digest properly and they end up starving to death. So it's a really sad issue. And again, it's not a one big patch. It's just kind of an area that it kind of collects. And that's 
a big scale, but even on a smaller scale, the way that the currents work, like in Hawaii, you will notice that places like Waikiki and the North Shore don't get these massive pileups of garbage. But on the east side of the island, you get massive massive piles of garbage wiping up onto the boat onto the beaches and so you're pulling in nets it is it smells foul and so yes it really currents play a, a role a huge role in where our gar garbage is collecting okay. Kendra what are you seeing in your your area study with regards to garbage so garbage, I was going to be doing a research project on pollution ingestion by echinoderm species on the island of Oahu my senior year, but COVID canceled that. I was not allowed to do that. And um, but yeah, I worked in conservation with I did beach cleanups every month and organized them and saw plastic pretty much on every shore. The worst. Yeah. Like what Mackenzie just said, we rarely ever saw any in like Waikiki area. So we hardly ever did cleanups over on. Um, the South Shore and West Side was pretty fine as well, um, but plastic everywhere and it is infecting the invertebrate level. Um, the reason I was going to study echinoderms, sea stars and sea urchins, was because of a previous study done on sea urchins and PET, which is just a type of plastic. Um, pollution ingestion on like the nano level, so something we can't really see to the naked eye. And studies like that are increasing and they may seem like kind of pointless because we're like, seabirds eat plastic, the whales are eating plastic, everything's eating plastic, why do we need to like keep analyzing it? But these critters, our little guys, are bottom of the food chain, same with um, Tinafores, my loves. And there was a really great paper actually done that was studying slicks off of the, I believe, west side of Oahu that looked at larval fish and their ingestion of nanoplastics. Um, and it was like 40% of them have started eating plastics. And at that small of a level, like these plastics are making up a significant portion of their diet. They get blocked. They don't go through their digestive tracts. More animals die. Um, and our inverts and our plankton, they are usually the base of the food chain. So when they're infected, it's going to bioacclimate up and up and up along the food chain. When larval fish are eating it, that's where the humpback whales are getting it because it's little, like little krills, little larvae, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I see it with what, <laughs> with what I do as well. It's from micro to macro level that we're seeing plastic in this in the ocean ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a couple more questions from the chat. Um, do any of you have uh, tips for high schoolers who are wanting to enter this field, the field of marine science in general, um, both from an academic point of view and, and maybe some extracurriculars? I'll just open that up to whoever wants to jump in. I'll go first. OK. Um, I think when you're in high school, you should try to explore as much as you can from your school. If you're into science, then start exploring what that means. Start taking those extra curriculars. Like I said, I took both marine science and forensics because those are the things that I thought were most interesting. Um, and my advice is when you're applying for schools and when you're preparing to get into college, don't limit yourself to only applying to like marine programs. I always tell people that the best thing you can do in your undergrad is to do a general science. Like Kendi did biology and then had a, you know, concentration in marine science. And it gives, it just doesn't limit you. Like I got my degree in forensics and that kind of limited me in some ways. Like I'm very lucky that I was able to charm myself into some marine um, opportunities which opened other doors. Whereas if I had just had a general biology degree or biochemistry degree, I would have been able to kind of explore forensics, explore that, you know, that research and if I like it or not, and then discover I didn't like it and be like, oh, I, I still have this biochem degree to fall back on. Now I can go and explore something else. So just, just don't limit yourself. Try and explore as much as possible because you really, you don't know it. Like, unless you think that you're just 100% definite, no, without a doubt, that that's what you want to do, then do it. But if you're like, I have three or four sciences that I love, and I don't know which one to pick, then don't limit yourself. Get a, get a biology degree or start looking at places that have, you know, just general sciences, and then start talking to your academic advisors, start talking to your deans, and ask them if there's, marine, or there's different op research opportunities and where you can go, and then start exploring and see what you actually like, because you won't know if you like something until you're doing it. 
until you are actively doing it. I promise you, because I thought I was going to love forensics. I thought it was so cool. And in the first year, I was like, this is awful. <laughs> I cannot do this for the rest of my life. So just, just, just explore, explore as much as possible. Yeah, it sounds like keeping an open mind is probably really important. Um, and yeah, you're right. I think it's easy to think you know how something will be, um, how a career will be, and then you start doing it. Um, Kush, what would you say? What advice would you give to high schoolers? Um, I think Mackenzie gave a great had a great point uh, on academic uh, path, but I think I'll add on where uh, I think outside of school uh, they could do something if they want to. Uh, into science. I feel like uh, for me, doing internships kind of really helped me um, know if I really liked the field or not. Because uh, in that, I was, I did it when I was 16, 17 years old as well. You would just shadow some people um, in a research institute and they would tell you about what they do, take you on their field work. Um, so I think that's a great way to actually. Uh, at that age, see someone uh, or any any person in the institute of any age, like at, um, whoever they pick or they get assigned to, uh, like how that person's life looks like. They can ask them about uh, how is their work life balance. Are they enjoying uh, their day to day routine? Or and they, you actually get to see them at work. So I think that's a that was a great way for me to actually. Um, learn about the field as well at a young age um yeah i think that's my addition to that <laughs> would you add anything to that kendra yeah first and foremost my advice to high schoolers are not to stress out too much because i did nothing in high school to prepare i was from arizona no ocean um i was a mock trial and theater kid so i had a couple like awards for like best prosecutor from mock from mock trial and i played hannigan in my school's production of annie so i got some singing chops but i past that i had nothing on my resume but when i applied for college that had anything to do with science besides grades and an sat score um which was like very average so enjoy high school as well but if you're wanting to get prepared that's where go for it um i ended up volunteering at a zoo for two summers didn't go on my resume or to my, my college application i did it after but it was great it gave me amazing animal husbandry skills um, that i've now applied in my career many many times um, i worked in a lab and took care of fish every day at the zoo i worked with birds a little different but there are some basic skills that do cross over with just animal husbandry, keeping on top of things, knowing how to do certain paperwork, that kind of stuff. Um, so if there's a local zoo, a local aquarium, I know Van Aqua does have volunteer. I don't think right now because of COVID, but at some point they did and they may open that up again. Any local zoos, if there's any animal sanctuaries, um, volunteer at a humane shelter. I think those are great. And past that, if you can pick your high, your high school classes, which I could not, but if you can and you maybe know you're going to be worried about math or about science classes, I'd recommend taking them in high school, kind of getting some introductory. So if you're like, ooh, chem's really intimidating, but I'll wait to take it in college, I would recommend you don't wait till you're taking it in college. Uh, I had like no chem preparation and it ruined me. I wish I had taken a class and could have chosen a chem class in high school to prepare myself and just to kind of have a leg up on what was going on. It wouldn't be the same as my college course, but it would have helped me just a little bit more where I struggled severely, which was in chemistry. <laughs> oh, hindsight. <laughs> Hindsight's always perfect. Oh, yeah. I just, I just wanna say, cause I think Chris's advice is incredible because the a paper came out last year talking about just how little paid opportunities there are in marine science, especially if you don't have any experience. So Kush's like advice of going to get internships, getting experience is brilliant because then you get the experience that you have a much better probability of having paid experience or having paid opportunities. And when you're in college, those are vital. Those are so necessary. So I just want, that's all. <laughs> yeah, on, on that note, we had a question from uh, the viewers. How, what are your tips on getting internships? Um, are there any sort of best practices or things that work for you? Who, who wants to hop in? Um, in my case, I just wasn't shy. I would just personally by myself look for people on the internet, send them an email, 
um, and the, some of them wouldn't respond, but one or two would reply. And um, yeah, so you just don't be shy. Approach people. Be honest about what what you why you want to do it with them. Um, I honestly uh, got a response from the director of a research institute, and they were really impressed that I like emailed him directly <laughs> to ask for something like this. But um, just just to say that, um, yeah, um, get out of your comfort zone and don't be shy. Uh, there's nothing for you to lose. <laughs> so <laughs> just go for it. Um, look on the internet. If you see someone who um, whose career path or whose field you think you you're interested in or you want to ask them more questions, just reach out to them. Yeah. Yeah, good advice. Be, be tenacious. Just hop in. I just want to say that be, be wary of who you reach out to on the internet. Make sure you're reaching out to people from universities or from accredited Yeah, institutions. that's a good point. <laughs> um, just because there's a lot of like uh, like nonprofits or conservation organizations. Kendi, you can probably, you already know what I'm talking about. Sorry. There's a lot of uh, conservation organizations out there that don't have that have a good reputation on social media, but don't have a good reputation within our field. With on our mm -hmm. field, we don't have a very good look on them. And so working with them can actually be more of a hindrance to you than it could be beneficial. So just be wary, make sure you're looking through actually accredited institutions through your mm -hmm. university, which also gets me to say that you should talk to your dean. Talk to your dean, talk to your student, um, your student advisor. Those guys are literally there to help you. Um, I got my inter internship through my through my professor and through my dean. My dean was an epidemiologist, and she and Dr. Ruth Gates, who was a coral researcher, were besties. And that's how that happened. Like you wouldn't <laughs> expect that, right? You wouldn't expect an epidemiologist to be friends with a coral researcher, but that's what happened, and that's how I got the opportunity. So speak to people at your your university; they're there to help you. Awesome. Um, we're heading into just about the last five minutes or so, um, and we did get a question um, that kind of touches on something we were chatting about pre prior to the session. Um, so the question is, how much of your time is spent analyzing data versus working on the site? Which is maybe the broader question is, um, what are some common misconceptions about working in marine science? Um, Kendra, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, so there's this con conception that we're in the water all the time or on the water, on a boat, whatever, that tends for the majority of people in this field, I would argue, is field work is the smaller portion of what we do. Data analysis, desk work, lab work tends to take up the bulk, um, working online, whatever that may be. Uh, so for me, when I worked in a lab, I worked in a wet lab, which was just a marine research lab that encompassed anything and whatever the professors threw in there. I was doing. And uh, I was in the lab five days a week if there was a her or Hurricane watch, it would be seven, making sure tanks were not shutting down and we had everything backed up. Uh, but I sat there, I did 19 hours a week sitting in a lab and maybe once a month we would go out and either do a species collection, which we had permit to do. So we'd go collect new fish for the lab, any critters that we needed. Um, we would organize labs with the students. So I would go out, I was also a teaching assistant. So I was in charge of making sure no children not children, college students, <laughs> were getting swept away in the water while we were out doing labs and, and the like. Um, sometimes going out with professors at three in the morning to get the tide just right, to find just the perfect animal. But that was maybe 20% of what we did. And that's only 20 because during COVID, we did a lot more because we had to film everything, which then, so for every, we probably did three hours of the field and then maybe like five hours editing down the video we took for the students at home to watch. And that added a lot of lab time as well. So even, even when we had more field work, thanks to COVID, it then had, it gave us more desk and homework, thanks to COVID. But yeah, so it was about an 80, 20, 90, 10 split for me in my, when I was working in a marine biology lab. Kush, how about you? Um, yeah, it's the same for me as well. Like I would say fieldwork is probably less than 10% of the time and even less in winter. Uh, even with my robots, I would pro I need to go out at sea to deploy them, to launch them and recover them. But that's just one day out. <laughs> 
and then um, the in the middle, so it stays out in the uh, in the water for about six weeks or more. Um, and during that time, I'm piloting it remotely, so I'm not really on the field. Um, so yeah, and even the field work, it's it's attractive. It's really exciting because it's an adventure all the time, but it's it's also hard work. <laughs> You are expected to carry these really heavy instruments, uh, wake up really early in the in the morning, work like maybe 12 hours in a row, do night shifts. Um, so uh, it, it comes with its, um, it's, it's quite demanding, but also rewarding. Um, but yeah, uh, and also um, about analyzing data and fieldwork for me, one common misconception is that um, I, I think I was underestimating before I got into the field how much coding and programming I would have to do in oceanography. So when I say I have to pilot my robots, I don't like, you know, it's not like a joystick in video games. So, so it was just, I wish it was, but it's not. Um, it's all coding and programming, uh, telling it where to go, what to do. How to do a mission it's all in code so um so I, I wasn't expecting that when i got in the field uh but i'm learning and it's um um it's going well so far <laughs> yeah oh, that's interesting yeah all, like all kinds of skills that you must have to bring in um in any given field that you just don't you know ever expect um again yeah. what would you say is something that is um maybe a bit of a misconception um, I, I think like they very much covered it. It's like I, of the years of marine uh, like science that I've done, not including my marine naturalist work, because I've also done that where you are, are actively in the field, documenting activity, submitting that to NOAA. Like that's a, a kind of a different career path. They have intersections, but they're a bit different. But my experience as a marine scientist, I really only got in the water actively once. Other than that, it was collecting samples from other labs, bringing it to my lab, and then analyzing. And it was, you know, we go to wet labs and, you know, HIMB, you have to get on a boat to get to the lab. So like, does that count? But other than that, not really. Um, you, you know, you're in a lab, you're in a dark space too, a lot of the times. Some of the labs don't have windows. Like you think that marine science is going to be like sunshine and beach and, and like dolphins. And really, you're just like, with an electron microscope in the darkest room of your university, trying to run R and praying that you don't get any red. Like that's really what it is. And it's, you know, and I think a lot of people have this mis misconception that marine science is somehow less of a science and less difficult. And that's couldn't be any, any farther from the truth. There's definitely positions where you don't have as intense of science or as intense of math, but there are also positions where the math and the science are incredibly intense. So it's, it's it's not an easy field by any means. <laughs> Jen, you're, you're muted, Jen. Oops, Jen. Sorry. Okay. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> um, it sounds like um, you know you could be doing anything from coding robots and piloting them uh, to visiting Antarctica to collecting killer whale poop um, or you know working in a in a dark lab so um, sounds like marine science is a pretty interesting field and there's a lot of different ways to you know work in that field um, so yeah thank you all so much for joining us today it was a really fun conversation that went by so fast um, so thank you to all of our mentors thank you to all of our participants who who were here and had such great questions um, and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of girls in steam uh, that, that's happening this week thanks everybody Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. This was fun. <laughs>